And now I'd like to turn to uh, Greg Mahler. Dr. Greg Mahler is a professor of environmental chemistry and toxicology in the Soil and Water Systems Department, the Chemical and Materials Engineering Department, and the Biological Engineering uh, Department at the University of Idaho. His research and teaching fo focuses on the safe and stable water and food systems. It's been fun watching Greg's developments over the last few years. His most recent patent, Biochar Water Treatment, allows for a carbon negative water treatment solution that advances water re reuse, food security, and climate change mitigation. And you may have heard of Dr. Mahler's work uh, in the, uh, because his University of Idaho clean water machine team were one of four finalists in a $10 million Everglades Foundation Char George Barley Clean Water Science Prize, which addressed the global challenge of phosphorus pollution and harmful algal blooms. So Greg will talk to us about biochar and Biden, opportunities in a new climate-driven bioeconomy. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you to the organizing committee of National Biochar Week for inviting me to visit with this group today. Um, as, as Tom introduced me, I'm a professor and I've actually been teaching online and we'll go ahead and say a quarter century to put it in the biochar century type context. Um, and just so that you know, what I'm going to do in terms of my slides and slide presentations, I've made it so that you can move the icons, the video icons, up to the upper right of your screen so they'll be able to see most of the slide. Um, and up on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, you'll see myself uh, in a White House uh, science meeting that's had to do with uh, nutrients and water pollution from nutrients and nutrient recovery. Uh, it was a White House meeting in 2016 when uh, uh, then Vice President uh, Joe Biden uh, walked up to me uh, with the expression, hi, I'm Joe Biden, uh, a starstruck uh, professor, researcher. Um, I pulled myself together and said hi. And for the next 20 minutes, we talked about uh, rural challenges in the West. We talked about some of the research. Um, and in fact, it's kind of, uh, um, Terrorizing, I guess, is the way to say it uh, when the Vice President of the United States asks for your business card. What I do and what I was talking about then, and I'll talk a little bit briefly about now, is what I do, and, and that's uh, water treatment. As you can see from my license plate, IDAH2O. Um, I've kind of stuck with uh, that uh, uh, for quite a while. Um, what you see on the screen here is uh, uh, essentially when uh, NBC Nightly News uh, showed up uh, to talk about biochar water treatment. And in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see perhaps one of the few profile pictures on broadcast news to 7 million people of biochar. Um, so being able to speak to folks about biochar, its promises, its problems, uh, the practical realities of it, its potential to help address our situation of global climate change is important for all of us. In my mind, uh, for biochar, it's a use it or lose it situation when it comes to our climate and to planet Earth. Now, where are we? Well, part of what I've been doing over the past uh, two or so decades has to do with research, and some of this research has been incorporated into a biochar water treatment process. We've had some success in scaling up water treatment of various kinds uh, globally, to be honest, uh, and we're now actually treating millions of uh, people's water, uh, treating billions of gallons of water each day. Our current research supporters are USDA and EPA, and I have a very large and very talented team working with me side by side. We call ourselves the Blue Wave Project. Uh, it has to do with uh, the fact that we're using a little bit of biomimicry, and that's a blue whale that you see that can filter 30,000 gallons of water with one gulp. So we're going to talk about today the current transition of President-elect Joe Biden as an opportunity, and it's an opportunity to explore the interface of the new ideas that always are presented in a presidential transition. And we're gonna see how those new ideas intersect with the super wicked problem of climate change. And for those of you that haven't heard of a super wicked problem, it's one of those problems that it has, it involves everything, uh, whether it be food, transportation, energy, the economy, our social and security status across the globe. 
And so this is something that affects all of us beyond the boundaries of nations. So when we do this, we're gonna to have to have a little bit of an outline for today's presentation and give you, we're gonna use presidential transitions as a context. This is a, in terms of climate change, a clear and present danger. A presidential transition right now is a clear and present occurrence. It's happening every day for the next 50 or so days. And we are, during this particular transition, uh, witnesses and in some cases participants in something that is monumental in terms of American history. We're also then going to transition, if you will, into a background about soil carbon. The idea being that we need to talk about those subjects that not everybody can talk about, um, general public primarily. We're going to talk about biochar and other strategies in the new climate-driven bioeconomy. Yes, we do have a good bioeconomy. It's called agriculture and forestry uh, and all of the ancillary uh, industries associated like that. But we'll talk about perhaps how it may be more climate-driven. We'll talk about, in particular, the Climate 21 Project USDA Transition Memo, which lists some practical recommendations to accelerate this new transition, this transition of ideas that comes companies every presidential transition. So when we talk about presidential transitions, especially when we're involved with that super wicked existential challenge like climate change, it all requires action. And my action values are adapt, innovate, overcome, and inspire, drafted a little bit from the US Marines, adapt, improvise, and overcome. But since the first United States presidential election in 1789, the transition of every new administration has been a fountainhead of new ideas. And in fact, that was an easy transition in American history. In American history, what we find is that when Party to party transitions, the same party, if you will, political party, those are a little bit smoother, but when there are cross party transitions from one party to another, those can be a little bit more difficult, less of a handshake and perhaps more of a fist fight. If we go back to um, uh, two presidents uh, that talked about action and the action perhaps that we need towards climate change, or at least the attitude, um, Thomas Jefferson's uh, in transition in 1800 was one of the messier ones from John Adams. In fact, uh, it was more of a fist fight than a peaceful transition. It actually yielded a whole bunch of mess. Um, and uh, uh, although, um, and we ended up with uh, Madison versus Marbury in terms of the Supreme Court actually deciding who's really got the power, whether it's the executive branch or the courts. Uh, both uh, then citizen Donald Trump in 2013 and an internet meme, uh, actually, uh, in terms of action, do you want to know who you are? Don't ask, act. Action will delineate and define you. Um, actually, that wasn't Thomas Jefferson. It was a Polish author uh, in the er early 1900s that coined that phrase. But presidential transitions and presidents themselves have been bastions of new ideas and bastions of new uh, possibilities for the future. So let's talk about something that's a little bit dirtier than politics, and that's soil carbon. And so for those of us that aren't uh, daily practitioners in agriculture, but we care about climate, we care about climate change and what we can do as individuals, how we can change the world for the better to address this existential threat. And so soil carbon, as it turns out, is a combination of organic matter and mineral carbonates that are in the soil. And soil organic carbon is actually the third largest carbon stock after oceanic and geological pools. So we hear a lot about the ocean, we hear a lot about the atmosphere, and we hear a lot about the carbon that's sequestered in geological pools, but we don't necessarily hear as enough about soil carbon. As it turns out, below, below ground carbon sequestration accounts for nearly 46% of Earth's total carbon fixation. And that number was actually just generated here in August 2020 in the Proceedings of National Academy Science Report by Gerardi and Sala. So this is significant and therefore using soil for carbon sequestration, the application of biochar perhaps is one of the ways to address this existential threat of climate change. 
We saw that existential threat of, of soil mismanagement in the 1930s in the Dust Bowl. And you can see that in this array of pictures. Uh, I wasn't there to exist, uh, to, to observe it, but um, for those that were, it was a horrendous existential challenge, if you will, to their life and livelihoods. Um, we've addressed that over the past uh, century or so with low-till or no-till practices, cover crops, and leaving carbon residues, uh, growing larger root mass crops to secure soils, double cropping. But in, if we look at this in the context of carbon farming and agriculture, um, perhaps that recalcitrant carbon from biochar can be considered as what is referred to as an NET or negative emissions technology. And if you are banking carbon, you have the potential to actually use that as an economic driver within the constructs of agriculture and the agricultural economy. So what if we do a, a gut check on biochar and how it fits into a negative energy technology? What are those, some of those concerns? Well, most of us know that for, in large part, we get improved soil quality with um, biochar. Soil carbon sequestration biochar, whether it be by normal like no-till practices or with biochar application, they can increase agricultural productivity, water retention and beneficial soil microbes. Those act to give us more food productivity, more food security. But sometimes uh, we have to deal with um, the, the amount of potential loading in soil carbon. Uh, it can only hold so much and the reversibility that when you disturb soils, you can actually encourage release of carbon from soils. There's also another concern about the difficulty of measurement. How do we quantify, if we want to bank or look at carbon farming, how do we monitor and verify carbon removal in terms of a life cycle assessment? How do we do that in a practical, coherent, traceable way? One of the concerns that we have, and we will increasingly have in terms of the biochar community, is if we consider to be biochar a net and a net um, a negative uh, energy technology, what is the governance that is appropriate for that? What are the policies, the practices, and what in fact is the system of reliable strangers that we need to have to make this a larger impact potential in terms of addressing the existential threat of climate change? And so when we have sustainable biochar production, and we have monitoring and verification, we can encourage adoption. This adoption, the system of reliable strangers is actually a military um, based uh, dynamic uh, from how uh, militaries, especially on aircraft carriers, used to ensure that in fact, the flight decks were extraordinarily clean. In terms of system of reliable strangers, next time you get to fly in an airplane, think of all the strangers involved to make that airplane, that tube of aluminum stay in the sky and give you a very comfortable flight from one point to another, defying gravity in a very safe way. We need that same system with respect to biochar. And so some of those dynamics in, in terms of sustainable biochar production have to do with biomass sourcing, production traceability, and perhaps that's an application for techniques such as, bio, as a, um, blockchain. Uh, when we're talking about monitoring and verification, what are the policies? What are the standards? How do we actually calculate the, the dollars and cents uh, and that mass load of carbon that might be able to be banked in a reasonable way? Think of how a bank audits your cash. The same thing is going to have to happen with carbon. In terms of encouraging adoption, we have good policies and good practices and good opportunities within research and agriculture extension, which has outreach in every rural community across the United States. Government actually incentivizes good behavior. It does it through tax rebates. It does it through positive policy and encouragement. So if we do establish a carbon bank and we do establish carbon farming, how do we then also address the soft stuff? And what I mean by that is the sociological dynamics of carbon and particularly essentially as agriculture as climate heroes. So the soft stuff is something that we should not forget as we move forward in the adaption and uh, adaptation of biochar as a way to address climate change. So biochar as a negative emissions technology, what do we look at it when we look at um, standard technology transfer technology development? 
A TRR, our technology ready, readiness levels, gives us the ability to, to actually quantify where a technology is and whether it's ready to do what it needs to do. Um, in terms of NASA, the technology readiness level will actually look at technologies and all the way up from zero to, to technology readiness nine will establish whether or not a technology has what it takes to actually go do planetary exploration. Well, in terms of biochar, we all know that soil, sequest soil carbon sequestration um, and biochar are mature technologies. Uh, we know that they're already in widespread use. We know that biochar is, is produced and used in relatively small quantities relative to world or global agriculture, um, but both would need to be scaled up substantially to achieve significant climate benefits. But that sounds like what could be, but in fact, in the NASA technology readiness level, you can evaluate biochar as a negative emissions technology as technology readiness level eight, and nine is the highest on that scale. So it's in final approach to have this potential in cap uh, world um, impact that uh, we perhaps all hope for and need. So the potential scale and cost is something that's extremely important when we deal with biochar. We need to know that soils hold about three times the amount of carbon dioxide and about four times the biosphere, all the living things on the planet. But over the last 10,000 years, agricultural land conversion has decreased soil carbon by a huge amount, 840 gigatons of carbon dioxide. But that's humans interacting with their environment. But in agriculture or cultivated soils, many have lost about 50% or 70% of their actual organic original carbon. So some of the soil carbon sequestration by biochar, by good carbon farming techniques can actually scale up to sequester billions of metric tons even in the next few decades to have a cumulative potential that's very, very high in terms of overall global impact. So the Climate 21 project is a Biden transition memo focusing on USDA. So I told you in the outline, we're gonna talk about some of these practical um, uh, sorts of transition level um, ways to kind of deal with climate change. So the Climate 21 Project is about 150 experts with government level experience, high level experience. Some of them actually Senate confirmed at the undersecretary level of many of the units of the executive branch. A rapid start, whole of government climate response. The focus right now is on USDA and its unique position and ability to act on climate change. It has almost 100,000 employees in 4,500 locations. We include the Forest Service and the National Resources Conservation Service. Um, it has the flexibility to target billions of dollars to climate smart practices and other initiatives. The neat thing, the not, thing that I've really appreciated throughout my career about USDA and the Agricultural Extension Service is that it has both a rural and urban influence. So in this transition memo, there are some actual objectives to, for instance, on day one, have the Secretary of Agriculture do an order to signal what climate change is a top priority of the USDA. Also to invest by day 100, establishing a carbon bank using the Commodity Credit Corporation. Thirdly, to incentivize, again in the first 100 days, incentivize climate smart agriculture and rural investment financial tools. A lot of what USDA does is rural development grants and loans. You can accelerate and initiate climate smart practices with the checkbook. How do we extend that, we can actually in the first 100 days, according to the Project 21 climate folks, decarbonize rural energy and promote green energy and smart grids. And how do we do that? We're already kind of doing it with methane digesters, biofuels, wood energy, and wood product innovation. And the other thing, the downside of climate change, as we all know, is wildfires. We have to get smarter, climate smarter and, and management smarter about wildfires. We have to increase forest restoration. We have to modernize firefighting. We have to come up with a commission that has the power and potency to actually direct this from the executive level. We have to also establish a carbon bank, which through the Commodity Credit Corporation, which is a huge enterprise, a $60 billion enterprise, 
um, that would be able to guarantee price for producers while guaranteeing the integrity of carbon conservation. And for an example, a $1 billion funding would actually uh, be able to produce a reduction of 50 megatons in greenhouse gases annually. So to close up, the president-elect uh, Biden and biochar, the outlook is we have a climate-driven bioeconomy potential on our doorstep, and its major driving force will be carbon banking. USDA will become a major force in climate change. We attempt, we'll, we'll probably see some rapid mobilization, but presidents have always been change agents. I'll close out now with talking about um, uh, a particular uh, change agent. Um, this is President Kennedy, he delivered in June 10th, 1963, a talk uh, addressing uh, nuclear proliferation. And in his talk, he actually went ahead and said, our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and no man can be as, and no man, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the un seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. With that, I thank you and thank the organizers, and I give you my salute to be safe, be well, and be bold, and be brave in the challenges we have today and tomorrow. Thank you so very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Wonderful uh, presentation. I think I'd like to uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, the uh, We're involved, the U.S. Biochar Initiative is involved in a current uh, activity um, the uh, uh, it called the biochar and next gen biofuels task force uh, in, in which we hope to uh, apply some pressure and reinforce uh, the climate 21 uh, and other recommendations for the uh, uh, for the Biden group uh, don't know Greg if you're aware of the of uh, uh, this biochar and and next gen biochar, uh, task force and, and how do we push this forward? How do we reinforce uh, and get get biochar on the uh, uh, on the climate twenty one agenda, if you will? Um, I, I'm aware of, of some of those actions and activities. Um, what I think is um, a part of the challenge uh, for the biochar community and for the general public is outreach and education. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, as a truth teller that. 80% of the people and perhaps more uh, don't know what I'm talking about when I say biochar. Uh, I teach a lot, I do a lot of outreach, um, I have to explain, and typically I use um, a uh, charcoal briquette um, explanation for what it is. Um, in the uh, um, NBC Nightly News piece, I had to uh, do the best job I could to explain what biochar is because it is not the term that perhaps um, the folks attending a conference like this know it and understand it in terms of the general public. So we, uh, in terms of the uh, application of biochar as a negative emissions technology, I, I think we are going to have to do a better job marketing. It perhaps isn't as sexy and glamorous as some of the high tech approaches. Um, and obviously we all as public um, are working on trying to minimize our emissions impact, uh, minimize our carbon footprint ourselves. Um, this is a way that individuals, uh, and communities and companies that don't have necessarily have a direct impact um, or process that is easily adaptable to carbon mitigation strategies can actually donate or use carbon banking and carbon farming as a way to offset their footprint. Well, and I absolutely agree with you on the, the education and outreach side. We recognize that at the U.S. Biochar Initiative. We've been trying to find ways in which we can uh, spread the word, if you will. A uh, challenge we have uh, is a challenge everybody has, and that is that is funding. I mean, if we can generate some funds to, uh, to do that kind of missionary work, do the, uh, uh, the, the educational piece, uh, I think it will make it a lot easier. The other is simply demonstration. We need uh, uh, either commercial demonstrations or, or uh, public demonstrations of simply showing that, uh, that the biochar works. We're seeing, I think, growing evidence of, of people. Uh, now, for example, if I go to a major horticultural show, for example, 
Uh, five or six years ago, I used to have to have to explain what biochar was. Today, uh, the uh, uh, horticultural wholesalers, buyers, and so on, they know what biochar is. They say, what do you have? What's the quality? How much? And when can you deliver it? Uh, so that we are making some progress, I think, in the commercial side. But I think with the general public, uh, we need to uh, create more education uh, and awareness. And I think that, as you suggested, most of the um, uh, sources, many of the people who are just getting into the biochar business, uh, I describe it sometimes as moving from a religion to an industry. There are those of us that are convinced that biochar is a solution, uh, but we have to be producing this at an industrial scale to be convincing. And we have very few industrial producers at this point. Um, and I know that you've been dealing with some uh, fairly large industrial producers, especially looking for biochars with consistent quality, with consistent specifications for your uh, wastewater treatment uh, and water treatment kinds of applications. And I guess what are your thoughts or what's your experience been with regard to finding sources of biochar uh, with consistent qualities that you, that you need for water treatment? You know, in general, you, you touch on something that um, is extraordinarily important in terms of when we encourage biochar use, we have to be encouraging something. And there's so many variables on the table. What we don't have, when we are talking about, for instance, in my field, water treatment, and, and what we do in biochar water treatment, by the way, is we adsorb nutrients, uh, especially phosphorus and some nitrogen onto the biochar and then reuse it as a nutrient upcycled uh, soil amendment trying to capture that as a negative emissions technology, but also addressing some water quality needs and also addressing these harmful algae blooms, which are, by the way, a product of climate change and disruption of climate patterns. Um, the biggest challenge that I have is when we do these at scale projects, uh, millions of gallons a day, there needs to be a supply source and there needs to be consistency in product. Um, that product has to show up Every day, it has to be um, certified at a certain quality because um, most regulatory, uh, most discharge dischargers are regulated dischargers, and they're regulated by the essentially level of pollutants that are in their discharge. It's a very costly enterprise if they violate their discharge, their permit to pollute. Um, and so there has to be this reality that it has to be a commodity grade, well tested chemical that can be supplied very, very um, uh, in very, very high qualities. I once calculated that the city of Las Vegas uh, adapting something in the order of biochar water treatment would be using eight tons of biochar per day to serve its 111 million gallons of water treatment per day. So these are large scale commodity type purchases and uses, but then we also have to address the aftermarket in this particular case of what do we do with that now nutrient upcycle biochar um, that has had uh, its increased value um, in terms of stabilizing nutrients, keeping them out of the waterways and putting them back in service to agriculture. So essentially biochar as a commodity uh, where you can actually select grades, percentages, um, uh, uh, some of the um, surface modifications, uh, the chemistry that's associated with using it in particular applications has to be realizable. And right now it's not. So we have a, we have a question uh, uh, from the attendees here. How can producers take advantage of this more receptive political environment to, to biochar? If we're creating a place, how can, what can producers do to, to take advantage of the, uh, uh, the new administration, if you will, if they're gonna be receptive to climate change? You know, I, I, I always like to go back to um, uh, Victor Hugo, um, who said, uh, you cannot stop um, a thing whose time has come. Um, I think it's a public education first priority. I think researchers have established uh, that in totality, uh, at least 80% of the papers that I read in the meta-analysis of biochar applications to agricultural productivity, um, it's a positive effect. Um, in many cases, some of the field yield trials are positive. So there's actually economic benefits. But the general public who actually pays the bills, um, when we um, are dealing in the marketplace, when we're dealing in government, we're dealing with other people's money. And quite often those are the consumers uh, and the taxpayers. 
And so we have to do more consumer level education, more taxpayer education in terms of practical climate uh, based actions and activities. Um, in World War II, we had victory gardens uh, because we had a national need to address food scarcity and food supplies in terms of the war effort. And people have talked about even in the pandemic of having victory gardens to ensure um, a stable food supply for folks and their families. Um, as a part of this victory garden concept where you get buy-in from the general public, the biochar can be a part of that process, but we have to educate people. We have to educate people at point of sale. We have to educate industries how they might be able to use this. And the food production uh, processing industry, they create huge waste streams, which typically just go down the sewer. There's a unique opportunity to use biochar, um, whether it be with um, biochar from anaerobic digesters or, or from direct solids and waste product management. Um, we have to come up with a more integrated solution, but we have to bring the public into that uh, in the same way that um, uh, electric vehicles and, and um, uh, uh, other sorts of net negative emission technologies have crossed the threshold of uh, human interest. Um, biochar, it's not necessarily at the same level as uh, folks that are driving next generation uh, expensive uh, electric vehicles, but it's something that's practical and low cost that each and every uh, citizen can do. Uh, whether or not people will buy in or have the opportunity, at least they can know about it and know the value of it in terms of addressing all of the economic losses and, uh, and turning those into gains in terms of the uh, climate change mitigation effects that we all have to do. And I think back on the question of, uh, of what can producers do when we were uh, attempting to put together a program to demonstrate a soil carbon amendment, which is a new uh, cost share program from the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. We went out to biochar producers. We went out to 100 biochar producers and they brought in, they brought in farmers. They brought in more than 200 farmers in 28 states and, and Guam uh, that were interested in trying biochar and testing it out. So I think that's a way that, that uh, those of us in the, in the business and the industry can reach out uh, to potential customers uh, and users. Uh, there's a question about whether uh, President uh, Biden will, will mention biochar in his State of the Union message. Can, can you get that one through for us? <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I consider uh, myself to be a friend of Joe. Um, you spend some, some moments with uh, a fellow like that. Um, and, um, you know, it genuinely, we, we've had a couple of follow-up meetings informal, um, and I'm not special. I'm not uh, an insider by any means. Uh, although a, a mutual colleague in a Dublin pub um, did tell me the story that, uh, when my name was brought up, uh, I, uh, the vice president called me Idaho Greg. Um, uh, but um, I, I'm gonna say uh, that what we need to do, we shouldn't wait necessarily for political leadership. Um, we should ourselves uh, go ahead and adapt, innovate, uh, uh, inspire and motivate others to, to um, act. Um, political leaders are good, to lead in certain domains, but we as citizens, we as individuals uh, at the consumer level, at the producer level, also have the ability to lead in our personal lives. So uh, with my students in my sustainability course, um, uh, I pretty much uh, try to empower them that if you wanna change the world, it starts with you and it starts with all of us. Um, when we go to this grocery store uh, with a simple act, uh, purchasing act, uh, where we pick one product over another because it's sustainability footprint, we change the world. It's a small act, it's an everyday act. And so biochar is the same sort of things in terms of productivity. I've worked with farmers uh, and ranchers for 30 years. Uh, there's not a one of them that wouldn't try something that promises um, uh, a better economic forecast in terms of productivity, increased yields, um, but also, and I think this is really important in terms of outreach, we have to address uh, the soft stuff in terms of rural communities and the uh, farmer rancher community. Climate change has been tokenized, uh, dismissed, discounted, confused. Um, we're gonna have 
our challenges ahead of us to roll back some of that and make it a practical economy. I like to call it uh, agriculture as heroes. Um, there isn't anybody in any occupation, especially folks uh, that uh, work in our food system that wants to be considered to be part of the problem. I think we all have a sense of pride and I think we have to actually yield that sense of pride to folks um, out in agriculture uh, that are getting their hands dirty, that are producing our food and we have to treat them as the heroes, the climate heroes that they are. And that's a change in uh, how we view agriculture, whether it be large scale corporate agriculture or small farm agriculture. It's all a part of the food system mix that we deal with in the United States and across the globe. Well, and I think that, uh, that farmers themselves, the growers that I work with are extremely interested in testing and trying biochar, for example, as a, as a tool uh, we'll be hearing through this week and seeing examples of some of the farmers who uh, learned to use biochar strategically using techniques like no-till and so on, where you're putting down uh, targeted uh, concentrated quantities of uh, nutrient amended biochars and so on that will solve particular problems. And I think on, on the other side, from an educational point of view, I'm encouraged when I see a large number of biochar products or biochar amended uh, soil amendment products on the shelf. The more shelf space we can get, the more exposure we have to the public, to the gardening public, and the more awareness we can create uh, about the fact that biochar exists. And, and uh, uh, slowly over time, as we see the results of some of our uh, biochar tests and uses uh, and get the word out, uh, one of the challenges I think we have is, is documenting and monitoring uh, where biochar works and where it can be used and where it shouldn't be used, which is equally important. Uh, we have this legacy of several years of attempting to put way too much carbon uh, in, in the wrong place and, and killing plants and, and creating problems that we don't need. And I think we've, we've evolved over the last 10, 15 years. We've learned more how to use biochar. Uh, but we need to get those uh, good success stories out. So one of the questions was whether uh, in this new context, um, uh, do you see biochar or uh, uh, programs, assistance programs for biochar getting down to, uh, to the farm level, to, to the small producer? Uh, or are we going to see, um, and, and I guess one example of that we'll hear about uh, later today, uh, from the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, the Soil Carbon Amendment Program. Uh, but, but do you see in, in a new administration that we would uh, hopefully see more of those kinds of policies and incentives? You know, I think, as I said, um, one of the roles of government is to incentivize good behaviors. And so you can look at whether um, uh, policies that uh, support or subsidize certain activities uh, solar energy, for example, um, and even oil production in certain areas, still a holdover from subsidies from a century ago. So we, we, we do have the ability within government and within our power, uh, the power of the checkbook, to incentivize via real dollars um, activities that the government and the social collective, the social contract says in terms of empowering transitions to better ways of thinking, better ways of doing. So I think we're in this era of transition. It's a presidential transition um, and we'll see. We'll see whether or not all of the challenges, all of the concern, all of the enthusiasm for addressing this existential crisis of, of climate change, whether or not we as citizens uh, can empower our leaders through our votes, through our passions, through our activities, and also from a point of purchase, whether or not we can empower a biochar economy that can have the potential impacts we all know it can in terms of climate change. Well, with that, Greg, thank you very much for uh, uh, a very educating and elucidating kind of presentation and, and especially your comments. Uh, I really greatly appreciated the chat. And uh, we look forward to your continued uh, creativity in, uh, in using biochar and water treatment. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tom, and thank you to the organizing committee of National Biochar Week. Good luck to you all.